Welcome to the Surface Analysis Lab at Virginia Tech, featuring state-of-the-art instrument of X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. I'm Xu Feng, the lab manager. This virtual course consists of two parts. In the first part, I will give you a mini lecture of XPS 101. In the second part, I will use a demo sample and walk you through a typical XPS session, including sample preparation, measurement, and data processing. Okay, let's get started with a mini lecture of X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, the XPS. In this section, I will give a mini lecture of X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, the XPS 101. It will help you establish the knowledge of XPS fundamentals and prepare you for a demo measurement in the next section. In this lecture, I will cover the history and principle of XPS, modern instrumentation, and a few examples of data analysis and applications. There have been countless scientists around the world who have devoted their careers to develop and advance the principle instrumentation and data processing of XPS. Here, I just want to bring up two Swedish physicists who happen to be father and son. The father, Man Sigbarn, was awarded the 1924 Nobel Prize in Physics for his discoveries and research in the field of X-ray spectroscopy. He developed equipment and techniques that allowed him and subsequent researchers to determine accurately the wavelengths of X-rays. His son, Kai Sigbarn, was awarded the 1981 Nobel Prize in Physics for his contributions to the development of high-resolution electron spectroscopy. He is the father of X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, the XPS. X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, the XPS, has an original name of ESCA, Electron Spectroscopy for Chemical Analysis, which speaks for itself. This surface-sensitive technique is widely used to identify elements on the surface of solid materials, their chemical states, and atomic percentages. XPS can measure both conducting and insulating materials in variety of forms such as powders, pellets, and thin films and have been widely applied in industries such as semiconductors, plastics, adhesives, and catalysis. So what is the principle of XPS? Let's picture a sodium atom sitting on the surface of a salt crystal. Electrons are circling the sodium nucleus in their respective orbitals with distinct binding energies. When X-ray heats the sodium atom, a photoelectric effect occurs. The photon energy of the X-ray overcomes the binding energy of this sodium 1s electron and eject it out of the atom. 
this photo emitted electron carries a kinetic energy, which is simply the difference of the X-ray photon energy and the electron's binding energy to the nucleus. When this electron reaches the XPS analyzer, its kinetic energy is measured and its binding energy is back calculated and shown in the spectrum. Thus, an XPS spectrum is generated by the count of electrons per second as a function of binding energy. The binding energy value of sodium 1s electrons to its nucleus is different from that of any other elements such as oxygen and carbon. Thus, elements can be identified by matching peak positions to their fingerprint binding energy values. The same principle applies to sodium 2s and 2p electrons. In addition to the identification of elements, XPS can probe the chemical state of elements thanks to a chemical shift effect. This is a unique advantage of XPS compared to other elemental analysis techniques. Chemical shift in XPS is the change in binding energy of a core electron of an element due to a change in the chemical bonding of that element. Let's picture a carbon atom bonded to a neighborhood carbon atom. The binding energy of the carbon 1s electrons to the nucleus is 284.8 electron volts. When the neighbor carbon atom is replaced by a more electron negative oxygen atom, the valence electron of this carbon atom are pulled away from the nucleus and toward the oxygen. As a result, the binding energy of the carbon 1s electrons to the nucleus is strengthened now at 200. 86.3 electron volts. Thus, a chemical shift of the carbon 1s binding energy occurs. Relying on the chemical shift, one can distinguish a carbon carbon bond from a carbon oxygen single bond or carbon oxygen double bond or carbonates by different binding energy values of carbon 1s electrons. The same principle applies to all elements. Besides element and chemical state identification, XPS also provides atomic percentages of surface elements. This task is accomplished by integrating the peak area of a specific photo emission peak for each element of interest divided by its empirical sensitivity factors, then normalizing all values to 100%. Now that we know XPS is a powerful tool to identify elements and their chemical states, there is one limitation of XPS that can be viewed either as an advantage or disadvantage. That is, XPS is strictly surface sensitive. In another word, all chemical information obtained by XPS originate from this near surface region of a material. When X-ray hits a material, it penetrates into the bulk of the material by micron depths 
with no problem and excites electrons along the way. However, the photoemitted electrons need to preserve their total energies when escaping from the material so that their kinetic energy can be correctly measured by the XPS analyzer and their binding energies be correctly back calculated. The inelastic mean free pass for a common photo emitted electron is less than two nanometers in solids, meaning that an electron on average travels less than two nanometers through the solid before losing energy. As a result, electrons emitted from atoms deeper than 10 nanometers from the surface of the material have zero probabilities to escape from the material without collision with other subjects. They lose part or all of their kinetic energies on their way to the analyzer and only contribute to the background signals in an XPS spectrum. Therefore, the probe depth of XPS is less than 10 nanometers. Since XPS is strictly surface sensitive, that it means that XPS cannot probe chemical information from the bulk of a material? Well, not exactly. An XPS system is commonly equipped with a spotter gun, which can etch solid materials at a speed of a few nanometers per minute. A repeated spotter and measurement process generates a profile with chemical composition as a function of depth. A spotter depth profile of an oxidized silicon wafer reveals the multilayer structure of the material as well as the thickness of the oxidized silicon layer. In addition, modern XPS can collect chemical information from a matrix of locations and resemble them into a map. The exhibition here is a gorgeous elemental mapping of gold in a 1000 micron by 1000 micron area on a substrate that was photoactivated to bind gold nanospheres in the shape of VT. With the principle of XPS in mind, it is not difficult to understand the setup of modern XPS instrumentation as demonstrated here. X-ray is generated by the electron bombardment of source and focused through a monochromator onto a sample. Emitted photoelectrons escape from the sample surface and travel to the hemispherical analyzer for detection and processing. Most importantly, in order for the instrument to function properly, ultra high vacuum is required to ensure negligible energy loss of electrons during travel. And that is why only solid materials can be analyzed by XPS in their original forms. To achieve ultra high vacuum, a two stage pumping system is commonly employed. The 5 Versa Probe 3 XPS here in the lab uses rotary vein pumps to reach 10 to the minus 3 tor 
and then turbomolecular pumps to drag out residual gas molecules to be able to achieve 10 to the minus 10 torr. To summarize this mini lecture, X-ray excites and emits electrons from surface atoms with fingerprint binding energy values. XPS identifies surface elements, their chemical states, and atomic percentages. XPS is strictly surface sensitive and requires uh, an ultra high vacuum environment. Lastly, here is a list of my favorite XPS resources. Now we are ready to move to the next section, a demo measurement. I will walk you through a typical XPS session, including sample preparation, measurement, and data processing. See you soon. Welcome back. Now that you have possessed the knowledge of XPS fundamentals, I'm ready to take you for a demo measurement. I'm standing next to the featured by VersaPro 3 XPS instrument. It consists of two ultra high vacuum chambers, a two stage pumping system for each chamber, an electronic tower, and a computer. A sample is mounted on the sample holder and loaded into this small introduction chamber to be pumped down. When the introduction chamber reaches a good vacuum level, the gate valve isolating these two chambers is lifted and the sample is transferred from the introduction chamber onto the sample stage in the main chamber. During measurement, X-ray is generated inside the top unit and focused onto the sample. Emitted photoelectrons escape from the sample surface and travel to the hemispherical analyzer for detection. Raw signals are amplified and processed by the electronics. Nowadays, most of these operations are handled by the computer through electronics, making it much more user-friendly. The hemispherical analyzer is a signature component of XPS and will help you spot an XPS instrument elsewhere. The demo sample in this video is a glass slide partially coated with a thin film of gold with a thickness of tens of nanometers. I'm going to mount the glass slide onto the sample holder. Sample preparation for XPS is rather straightforward. You secure the sample to the sample holder without any moving parts or loose particles and expose the surface of interest to the direction of the X-ray beam. A piece of double-sided tape is sufficient for most type of samples. The available analysis error settings of this instrument is between a few microns and hundreds of microns. So only a small quantity of materials is likely sufficient. Now that the sample is secured on the sample holder, I will vent the introduction chamber from ultra high vacuum to atmosphere load the sample into the introduction chamber, take a sample picture for possession reference, 
and let it be pumped down. The pump down process usually takes 30 minutes to one hour. Now the sample is being pumped down. Now that the pressure in the introduction chamber is lower than 4 times 10 to the minus 4 pascal, I'm going to lift the gate valve and transfer the sample onto this stage in the main chamber. Now the sample is in the main chamber, ready to be measured. We are at the user interface of the data acquisition software by SmartSoft. Sample measurements are handled here. I will use the gold-coated glass slide to demonstrate several features of this 5 VersaProbe 3 XPS instrument, including element and chemical state identification, elemental mapping, and sputter depth profiling. First, I'd like to quickly walk you through the software layout. The current system tab is the overview of the system status such as pressure gauges, valves, and system flow chart. It also controls the sample transfer process. Under the sample tab is the sample image on the upper left that was previously taken in the introduction chamber. The image on the upper right is a scanning X-ray image a unique feature of this instrument, which functions similarly to a low-resolution SEM to achieve accurate definition of analysis area on small objects. Under the XPS tab, one can set up parameters for spectrum, depth, profile, and mapping. Under the Hardware tab, one can tune up hardware settings for X-ray, charge neutralization, and detection. The first XPS feature I will demonstrate is element and chemical state identification. I start the measurement on the non-coated area of the glass slide. 
I define an analysis at point in this area, drive the sample to meet the X-ray beam at this point, and raise the sample to an anticipated height. Since I'm measuring an insulating material, charge neutralization is activated. During XPS measurement of an insulator, its surface region continuously loses electrons without prompt electron compensation from the bulk, resulting in a positively charged analysis area. These positive charges on the surface cause energy loss to the emitted photoelectrons which leads to lower kinetic energy detected, thus higher binding energy calculated. For this instrument, a combination of low energy flood electrons and low energy argon ions is able to resolve this surface charging effect. Now I proceed to find the optimal sample height for this analysis point and then perform a survey scan. Since the position and angle of the entrance of the analyzer is fixed in this instrument, an optimal sample height exists to provide maximum signal intensity. This auto process shown here probes signal intensity while raising the sample, and the height with the maximum signal intensity is, select, is selected before scanning. In the lower window is the live spectrum to survey the analysis point on the non-coated glass slide. A survey spectrum uses large step size and high pass energy to acquire decent signal intensity in a wide range of binding energy in a short time. A survey scan is best to review all surface elements, but usually is not sufficient to resolve chemical states. The MOS waves 
the better signal to noise ratios. But for demonstration here, a couple of sweeps are enough. After the service scan is finished, I open the data processing software by multipack and acquire the service spectrum here. I use the adventitious carbon peak to correct the binding energy scale and identify major and minor elements by matching peak positions. As you can see, there are sodium, zinc, oxygen, carbon, silicon, titanium, boron, and sulfur detected on the surface of the glass slide. In addition, I integrate the peak error of a specific photoemission peak for each element, taking atomic sensitivity factors into account to, to calculate the atomic percentage of each element on the surface. You can see that the surface is primarily composed of carbon, oxygen, and silicon. Then I perform a high-resolution scan of silicon 2P region to identify the chemical state of silicon. A high-resolution spectrum uses small step size and low pass energy to resolve subtle chemical shift, but could be time-consuming for surface elements with very low loadings. The lower left window is the silicon 2P region, and the lower right window is the carbon 1S region.
After the high resolution scan is finished, I acquire the spectrum in the data processing software. Use Adventitious Carbon Peak to correct the binding energy scale. Then match the peak position of silicon 2P to the values in the database. The peak position of 102.9 electron volts matches those of silicate and is well separated from that of silicon metal around 100 electron volts. Now I proceed to define and survey a location on the gold-coated area of the glass slide. The best practice is to find the optimal sample height for each analysis point, but I choose to skip it here since it's a flat surface. After the survey scan is finished, I perform similar data analysis to identify surface elements and calculate their atomic percentages.
The gold coated area of the glass slide shows primarily gold atoms with no signals from silicon. The superimposition of the surface spectra from these two materials demonstrate drastic difference in chemical composition, indicating that just tens of nanometers of gold thin film is able to block any XPS signals from the glass substrate. This is an excellent example to show that XPS is strictly surface sensitive. The second XPS feature I'd like to demonstrate is elemental mapping. I drive the sample to meet the X-ray beam and the boundary of the gold add layers and map the gold 4F signals in the 1000 micron by 1000 micron area. Depending on the X-ray beam size I use, which is 50 micron here, this area is divided into a 200 by 200 pixels, and the gold 4F region is scanned for each pixel as shown on the le lower left and resembled to a map on the lower right. Let's fast forward to the finished map. The brighter color in the map indicates higher signal intensity of gold. This map clearly demonstrates the boundary of the gold add layers under the view of XPS. The last XPS feature I'd like to show you is the spotter depth profiling. Here I will investigate the thickness of the gold coatings on the glass substrate by repeated spotter and measurement cycles. I choose the spotter gun setting that etches the solids at a speed of 1.7 nanometers per minute and monitor the signal intensities of gold 4F and silicon 2P. The spectrum of gold 4F and silicon 2P are shown on the left on the lower left, and a spotter depth profile is in the making on the lower right.
the measurement of the initial surface shows significant gold and no silicon. Then the surface is etched away of 1.7 nanometers in one minute and be measured again. Now the one minute, one minute sputter is finished and uh, one me another measurement begins. As you can see, the gold signals remain unchanged while a trace of silicon shows up. Let's fast forward to the finished depth profile. In this process, you can clearly observe that the gold signals are going down and the silicon signals are going up.
At this point, we can stop the depth profiling since both signals flatten out. I open the data processing software and acquire the profile data. I plot the profile using atomic percentage of gold and silicon as a function of depths as shown on the right. As you can see, the amount of gold is negligible beyond 18 nanometers depth, indicating that the thickness of the gold coatings is 18 nanometers and most. This is the end of this virtual course of X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. You have learned the XPS fundamentals and experienced a typical XPS session including sample preparation, measurement, and data processing. I hope it will enrich your knowledge in analytic chemistry and benefit you in your future endeavor. If you have any inquiry related to XPS, don't hesitate to contact me by email. Thank you for watching. Bye now.